We often hear about the negative side of stress and trauma, how it damages us. But what if I tell you that there's another side to the story that is equally important? What if we need stressors in the first place to grow? This concept is called post-traumatic growth and explores how adversity can actually make us stronger. It suggests that we can profit from challenges in our lives. In this video, you will learn about overcompensation, see practical examples of post-traumatic growth and probably discover new perspectives on the topic of stress and how we innovate. Well, it turns out that there is something called post-traumatic growth. A lot of people get traumatic stress disorder, but bad events make people grow. I mean, up to a point of course. Something that kills you doesn't make you grow. So there is something called post-traumatic growth and psychologists don't talk about it. All they talk about is a disorder. Nobody is going to make any money selling you post-traumatic growth. Because they don't have to treat you, nature is treating you. Often we hear that stress is bad for us. And as far as my knowledge goes, constant stress, and stress that kills us obviously, is far from good. But what we often neglect is that we need stressors in the first place to grow. And I'm not only talking about the psychological domain, that we build our character or we build our psychological resilience. I'm also talking about the physical domain of our bodies, for example. Because when we exercise, when we do weightlifting or something like that, when we do running, we also give our bodies physical stress, basically. But more on that later. Now the question arises, how does post-traumatic growth happen? The answer, we overcompensate. Overcompensation. It is just a form of redundancy. An additional head for the hydra is no different from an extra, that is seemingly redundant, kidney for humans, and no different from the additional capacity to withstand an extra stressor. If you ingest, say, 50 mg of poison that you can withstand, are no different from additional stockpiles of vital or necessary goods, say, extra cash in the bank or more food in the basement. So, overcompensation is a form of redundancy. About the topic of redundancies, I made an extra video, you will find it somewhere here, which is closely connected with this video here. But in short for you, the definition of redundancy. Redundancy is basically a buffer that we create by including extra resources in our system that are not necessary for normal operation. Redundancies are basically a buffer, a backup system. As Nassim Taleb said in this quote, we have two kidneys, but in theory we only need one. But when the one fails, the other one would take over. So we have an extra capacity or an extra backup system when one fails. And in this way, we would use the extra capacity, the extra redundancy, the extra kidney in a defensive way, right? We would be, we are more robust or we are more resilient with it. And this was a topic of my last video about these redundancies. But now in this video, where it gets really interesting, that Nassim not only says that we can use it in a defensive way, this extra capacity, this redundancy that we overcompensate, but we can use it aggressively. That means we can not just use it to be robust, but we can profit from those extra capacities, those extra redundancies. A system that overcompensates is necessarily in overshooting mode, building extra capacity and strength in anticipation of worse outcome in response to information about the possibility of a hazard. And of course, such extra capacity or strength may become useful by itself, opportunistically. We saw that redundancy is opportunistic, so such extra strengths can be used to some benefit, even in the absence of the hazard. Basically, by experiencing stressors and challenges in our lives, in the process of overcoming them, we are not just merely getting back to status quo, but we are overshooting. Let's make here some fake numbers. We are starting before the stress or the challenge in our lives arrives at 100. Then we have the challenge, let's say we try to overcome them, and we are not just ending up again at the same level as at 100, but we overshoot, we arrive at 110 for example. So we profit basically from this challenge, from this stressor, like in the process of over overcoming it. And I guess we all know it intuitively that when we went through difficult life situations or big stressors in our lives, most of us, as long as, of course, as this challenge doesn't kill us or doesn't ruin us, arrive at a stronger point than we were before. Now we can see here why overcompensation is anti-fragile. We are not just like getting back to 100, right? We are not like not profiting, make no plus or minus. Like we are not making plus minus zero, but we are literally profiting from it. So we are profiting from a shock. We are profiting from stressors. And that is 
why it's so important to have, of course, from time to time, some stressors or challenges in our lives to grow. If antifragility is what wakes up and overreacts and overcompensates to stressors and damage, then one of the most antifragile things you will find outside economic life is a certain brand of refractory love or hate. One that seems to overreact and overcompensate for impediments such as distance, family incompatibilities and every conscious attempt to kill it. Like tormenting love, some thoughts are antifragile that you feed them by trying to get rid of them, turning them into obsessions. Psychologists have shown the irony of the process of thought control. The more energy you put into trying to control your ideas and what you think about, the more your ideas end up controlling you. Personally, I experience both the love aspect and the thought aspect and I can totally just confirm his words. And especially in the domain with the thoughts of falling asleep. I don't know if you know this, but I know this extremely, that the more I want to try to fall asleep, the more it is not functioning at all. We can also inverse this. We can inverse this overcompensation and we can look at how does it look like when we undercompensate. Undercompensation from the absence of a stressor, inverse hormesis, absence of challenge, degrades the best of the best. Let's have a look at some examples to show the effects of under and overcompensation. When we exercise, our bodies are experiencing stress. But they need this stress in order to grow. That's how our muscles grow. When we train to lift a weight, let's say X, the next time we are able to lift a weight X plus 1, up to a limit of course. This is what we mean when we talk about overshooting or overcompensating. When we are undercompensated in this area, like no training, no movement, our bodies start to degenerate. And this isn't just true for our bodies, our minds need challenges too. The whole attitude I have towards medicine and everything, especially in antifragile, is when I'm very sick, I don't go to one doctor, I go to four doctors. And if I'm mildly sick, I go to no doctor. So basically, I overreact. Now I can just comment Nassim's words here from my own experience. Some years ago, I made the inverse thing. I just went for every mild symptom to many doctors. And that was totally stupid because I had a lot of negative consequences from this. But in the end, it was, of course, all my fault. And all of this here is no medical advice or something like this, yeah? Like, I'm um, just talking here about the topic of overcompensation and not some medical advice when you should go to a doctor or not. It makes just sense. When we have mild sy symptoms, our bodies can often heal themselves, right? Like, we don't have to go to a doctor when we have a mild symptom because the risk of some wrong treatment or the risk of my own wrong going there is much higher then probably the risk what we have from this mild symptom. Of course, when we're not sure, we can argue to go to better let it check up. But, you know, it's no medical advice, just a little bit some sort of experiment. But for sure, when we have something super serious, it's clever to just go to many doctors to get many different opinions and try to find the best treatment. So we overreact in this case. When life gives you a lemon, you make lemonade. And the only way to make lemonade is lemon. And a lemon in slang means a mishap. The idea is that you know there's going to be a lot of wind, so either you go to the basement and start crying and ask for government money, or there's going to be a lot of wind and you say, oh, I'm going to make some money out of it, build windmills. We will have wind or like lemons or whatever we, which word we use for stressors in our lives. And we can either just hide away and be unrealistic that they are not there, or we just embrace them, so to speak, and try to overcome them, try to engage with them and be actively, like, engaged in them. Dressers will come anyway, wind come anyway, and why not build windmills? Another area where we can transfer this concept to is the area of innovation. And to return to the drivers of innovation, the additional quantities of motivation and willpower, so to speak, stemming from setbacks, can be also seen as extra capacity, no different from extra boxes of victuals. This concept of post-traumatic growth in mind, it made for me so much sense why America is so successful. They have an especially, let's say, good failure culture. That means they, like, they don't cast someone out of society if someone fails, which is in some other cultures the case. And when someone failed, their first business, for example, yeah, like in the terms of a startup, their first business, their second business, they build extra capacities. They build extra let's say resilience, they build extra strengths, more willpower for the next project. Asim argues that from this, from this extra energy stems the power of innovation. We tend to think that innovation comes from bureaucratic funding, through planning or by putting people through a Harvard Business School class by one highly decorated professor of innovation and entrepreneurship who never innovated anything. 
or hiring a consultant who never innovated anything. This is a fallacy. Note for now the disproportionate contribution of uneducated technicians and entrepreneurs to various technological leaps from the Industrial Revolution to the emergence of Silicon Valley. And you will see what I mean. Yet in spite of the visibility of the counter-evidence and the wisdom you can pick up free of charge from the ancients or grandmothers, moderns try today to create innovations from situation of comfort, safety and predictability instead of accepting the notion that necessity really is a mother of innovation. And I think that makes so much sense. It is really difficult when we have no, let's say, this existential pressure or no pressure in general to really give it our all, right? When we, for example, want to build a startup on the side, of course, this is possible and some people make it for sure. But I guess this is pretty difficult to do when we have like our normal job. Of course, we have then our financial backup, so to speak. We have our daily income or our monthly salary. But There's so much comfort in this, right? Not just that we put a lot of time in this day job, but also there's so much comfort in this that it's hard to really feel this pressure to have to do something or to have to build this extra capacity of will, power and strength and those things. When you're interested in more videos like this, feel free to check out this video on redundancy, what I mentioned in the beginning of this video. Or when you're interested in more practical ways of thinking, basically mental models, feel free to check out this video. Thank you so much for taking the time to watch this video today and I hope you got some value out of it. And as always, I wish you a fantastic day.